Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. I'd like to welcome you to another in our segments of Conservationists in Action. Uh, today we have one of the most distinguished scientists we've ever had in our studio. We're very pleased uh, to have Lincoln Brower join us, somebody who's literally spent his life among the monarchs. Uh, and let me just tell you a little about Lincoln. Uh, before he starts telling us about the monarchs. First, welcome, Lincoln. Thank it's a pleasure are. having you here. Uh, Lincoln Brower has been studying the North American monarch butterfly uh, for more than 50 years, which is pretty extraordinary. And for the last three decades, he's made preservation of this unique migration uh, of the butterfly, his personal mission. Brower first began studying monarch butterfly biology in 1954, when he was a graduate student at Yale University. He is currently uh, Professor, research professor of biology at Sweetbriar College. His research includes the conservation of endangered biological phenomena, which he's going to talk about in just a bit. Also, the uh, overwintering and migration biology of the monarch butterfly, chemical defense, mimicry, and scientific filmmaking, all of which will pop up in your PowerPoint. <laughs> Brower's authored and co-authored more than 200 scientific papers on the monarch butterfly, and since 1977, he's been deeply involved with the conservation of the monarch's overwintering and breeding habitats, especially the imperiled Oyamel fir forest in Mexico, which he considers the Achilles heel of the monarch. To track deforestation, Brower's recently formed a geographic information system team, including students and colleagues from the University of Mexico, NASA, and Sweetbriar. He's also been involved with numerous conservation initiatives. Really, uh, Lincoln is, is one of our pioneers in the study of monarchs. I like to call him uh, the Charles Darwin of the monarch butterfly. <laughs> I know he's going to be embarrassed, uh, but it's really a pleasure. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has, has recently uh, stepped up our efforts uh, to protect the monarch in part uh, because of your lobbying and, and, and persuasive arguments. Um, so the timing is perfect. We're very happy to have you here, Lincoln. Well, it's a great honor to be here, Mark, and thank you for that kind introduction. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> thank you for your 50 years of service to protect uh, this one species. And uh, now, Lincoln, we'll turn it over to you and, and uh, learn uh, a synthesis of, of what you've learned in the last five okay. decades. Okay, well, what I want to do today is show you more slides probably than you can digest, but we'll, we'll hope we get through them all, which summarizes the grand saga of the monarch butterfly. And I think you will agree, if you don't already, that it is truly a grand saga. And it's something that's really precious and something that we need to protect. So let me get started with the slides. I always get to the end of my talk and don't have time to acknowledge all my friends and colleagues, but they come from all over the world. And this is a group of them here. And without their help, graduate students, colleagues, conservationists, I couldn't possibly have done what I've done. With massive support over the years from the National Science Foundation and private donors, the Wildlife Conservation Society, and so forth. So thank you, everybody, for making this possible. We defined an endangered biological phenomenon as a spectacular aspect of the history of an animal or plant species involving a large number of individuals that is threatened with in impoverishment or demise. It's not the species itself which is endangered, but rather this marvelous behavior that it exhibits. So that is what is endangered. And here's another example, wildebeest in Africa as we know, <clears throat> the fencing and so forth is breaking up their natural migratory routes and the migration of that incredible animal is, is endangered. One of the endangered phenomena in the United States was the bison migrations and they're just their numbers on the Great Plains of the United States. And that biological phenomenon is fundamentally extinct. Now, maybe we can bring it back. There's great efforts to do so, but as a phenomenon that was so remarkable, it's gone. And then the next step in this progression is extinction, and the passenger pigeon is a good example of this. You see the historical picture on the left where maybe billions of birds were flying over up until about 100 years ago when the very last one member of the species became extinct this year. This year is actually the celebration, if you can call it that of the loss of Martha, who was the last passenger pigeon. And what is ominous to me and to all of us and should be is that the distribution of the passenger pigeon 
It was very similar to the distribution of the Eastern North American monarch butterfly population. So here is the endangered biological phenomenon of the monarch. If you look very, very closely at that slide, you'll see at least eight mated pairs flying through the air. Believe me, it's true. <laughs> we'll take your word for it. <laughs> so what is the phenomenon? Uh, this is a map that shows the fall distribution, the fall uh, migration of the monarch, and it's from up to 2,000 miles in the Dakotas all, all the way to Maine flying in a straight line, which they don't do, so it's greater than that mileage, all the way to central Mexico, <clears throat> where they're gonna spend the winter and then fly back into the south, southern U.S. And in the spring, after spending five or six months in Mexico, the same butterflies that live and fly back to the Gulf Coast states where they lay their eggs and die. Now, if you look closely at that map, you'll see the Tropic of Cancer. The butterflies are flying back into the tropics. They're crossing the Tropic of Cancer, but they're not going into a palm-laden forest where in warmth and so forth and sun. They're going to a very high altitude forest where they're gonna spend the winter without burning up all their energy reserves. This is, <clears throat> this is the area where they're overwintering in, in central Mexico, about 60 miles west of Mexico City. And you can see on this mountain range that goes up to about 15,000 feet, with a snow-capped top, no trees at all, and then a pine forest. And then you see this arrow showing this Oyamel fir forest ecosystem. And it's a high altitude, 10,000 to 12,000 feet altitude forest, and it's that specific habitat that is absolutely the winter home of, of the monarch, and their survival depends upon the integrity of that system. And here we're looking at, a, um, at one of the pure OML forests where there's a monarch colony. You see the open area on the bottom left of the slide and behind it festooning the trees of a different color. Those are all monarch butterflies. And we figure they're in a, in a colony like that, they're probably 50 million per hectare. Wow. Which is a lot of butterflies to say the least. And this is looking up through an OML tree and you can see the clusters of butterflies on the branches. And in any one of those clusters, there's probably at least 5,000 butterflies. So the density is just it's such, it's incredible to see this. You just. And what, what this, in, this forest is in the tropics and what's different between the tarp, tropics and the temperate zone is the stability of the climate. If you look at the upper graph, it shows the temperature during the, the war, warm, warmest temperature each day. And you can see that it's very constant and it begins to climb towards the end of the winter season when the monarchs leave. And look at the lower graph, which shows the butterfly, shows the temperature hovering around zero or freezing. It gets down below freezing occasionally. We'll talk more about that. But what is so amazing about this climate where this forest occurs is the stability of it, both in terms of maximum and minimum temperatures every day during the season. Well, let, let's think a little bit about how this whole thing got started. This is a slide that shows a group of monarch-related butterflies. There's 157 species in the family to which the monarch belongs. The one on the bottom right is the monarch. Most of the, all of these butterflies are tropical and they're called milkweed butterflies because all of their caterpillars feed on plants that contain latex uh, that are one form or another of milkweed species. And so here you see a milkweed and why it's called a milkweed. If you break the leaf, there's a system that's not a vascular system, but a latex system and it protects the plant from being eaten. This latex is very bitter and it also acts as a glue that glues the caterpillars in place if they're not really careful. And so the milkweeds have their own protection and their own chemistry, which we'll get back to. But what we see is everybody thinks milkweed is one species of milkweed. There are actually 108 in North America, and this is a composite of their distribution from the East Coast to West Coast, lots of them in Mexico. And basically they're all temperate plants and they all die back during the winter time. So the monarch would have absolutely nothing to eat and it has to migrate back to the south. 
But what the migration really is all about was the evolution of the milkweeds, which was tracked by the evolution of the monarch. As the milkweeds evolved and spread and became abundant everywhere, monarchs had this incredible opportunity. And so, but they all die back, so they have to migrate south in the fall. And here you see the Mexico overwintering site again. And then after the butterflies have been there for five or six months, they migrate back to the Gulf Coast. The milkweeds are waiting for them. They're all up, they're beautiful shape. There's one, an old female who's come back from Mexico laying an egg on a plant when I was at the University of Florida. So this is North Florida. All along the Gulf Coast, there are all these milkweeds. Texas is particularly important. So they lay their eggs. There's two eggs on that milkweed leaf in the bottom of it. And about three days later, the little caterpillar hatches out. Now monarchs are very sensible insects because they control their own population size. The caterpillar will turn and eat the second egg that's near it, thereby cannibalizing and cutting down on the competition so they control their own population. It takes them about two weeks to develop through several stages to the full-grown caterpillar. And then it forms a beautiful green chrysalis shown on the right there. And about another week, the chrysalis hatches out. And here's the monarch butterfly of the new generation. And just think, this fragile creature will harden its wings and will have the capacity to migrate during its lifetime, perhaps up to 3,000 miles. Well, <clears throat> if we go back into the 19th century, the British natural historians looked at their butterfly collections. And they looked at for perfect specimens. Everyone had to be just perfect. Yeah. And, but if you look carefully at some of the specimens, you'll see these marks on their wings. And what does that look like to you, Mark? I Whoops, I went. It looks like some of its scales fell off or something, or what's? But what shape is the, is the mark? Beak. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're getting picked on. It's a them. beak mark. <laughs> and it turns out that lots of monarchs were beak marked, and other butterflies belonging to different groups were not. And the hypothesis was made that monarchs must be bitter tasting. The, butter, yeah. the bird bit it, found it was bitter tasting, and let it go. Well, I got very interested in this and got into the question of, are they really bitter tasting? Because it was also discovered that all these milkweed plants contain poisons which are related to digitoxin, which is used in the treatment of human heart disease. Right. And digitoxin will make you vomit if you take too much. It's also extremely bitter. And if you take too much, it'll stop your heart dead. So anyway, we got really interested in asking the question, is this really true? Is this complex chemical defense related to the plant and to the butterfly really true? So we trained blue jays to eat monarch butterflies. And they peck off the wings and throw them away. They usually peck off the legs and the antennae. They then swallow the abdomen whole. And then something's not quite right. This bird is beginning to feel a little yeah. bit ill. And 12 minutes later, it's over the side of its perch. And now I became famous for this. I'm, I'm known as, this is, picture is known as Brower's Barfing Blue Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud of that picture. <laughs> it's very iconic. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, the birds remember, and so that the, so later on, we, what we discovered was that if you raise monarch butterflies on different species of milkweeds, which they're in the one, two, three, five species of milkweeds in this picture, the one on the left, a butterfly raised on that has enough poison in it to make eight blue jays vomit. And the next one, 4.8 blue jays, and so on. And then we discovered that some tropical milkweeds contain no poison at all and are completely palatable. That was how we got the butterflies to eat, the birds to eat the butterflies in the first place. We fed them on the non-toxic plant. Then the blue jays were duped into thinking they were all fine. Then we slipped in the toxic ones, and then we were able to determine how emetic all these different plants are. Creating a new scientific unit of measurement, the blue jay emetic the, unit. <laughs> the blue jay emetic unit. <laughs> I've never unit. seen before. Yeah, it's a very effective way of describing how just so that so that if you think about a bird is out there in the wild and it sees a monarch, it's like Russian roulette. It may yeah. be toxic, it may be really toxic, it may be mo moderately toxic. So it's a really interesting complex situation going on in the wild in the wild. Next one. Well, 
In 1975, the overwintering sites of the monarchs were discovered in Mexico, and I'm going to talk about those extensively. And Bill Calvert, who was a postdoc at the University of Massachusetts, I was then at Amherst College, started talking about, let's see if we can find the monarch butterflies in Mexico. And Bill went down to Mexico and wandered around. And our strategy was to put a monarch, press it between two plastic pieces of plastic sheets, and ask local folks. And as you can see, these people had no clue where the monarchs were at all. So we'd ask these local people, and gradually Bill actually found the butterflies three days after going to Mexico, which was kind of an incredible. So two weeks later, I went down. We formed an expedition. This was in January 1976, 1977. And we drove into this place. And who should be there but Professor Urquhart, who was the man who was responsible for leading the, everybody to discovering these butterflies in the first place. He wouldn't tell us where it was, but we found it on our <laughs> own. And as you can see, he's not too happy in that picture. That was quite a, an interesting confrontation. That's another lecture. <laughs> so since 1977, I have studied the butterfly ecology and conservation of the overwintering phenomenon. Because when I saw it, it was overwhelming. I couldn't believe it. I realized right at the very first looking at those stacks of butterflies in the right picture, the whole population of the whole gene pool of the monarch is sitting here in one place. And the way we got into these areas was on logging roads. And it was clear that everything was endangered. Well, this is an aerial picture of the Sierra Chinqua, which is one of the 12 major mountains that monarchs migrate on. And you can see the very the, the light green trees coming up from the left are pines. And the ones is in the center and all the way up to the top are the OML firs. And, it's, and the, there's a, between those two arrows, there's a, a, a arroyo, a canyon. And the monarchs have been overwintering in there every year going back to 1975. Having a little trouble with this. It's not advancing. There we go. And here's another area, the Sarah Palon. And I think, you know, you work for the National Park, with the National Park Service. And that was one of the things that got me into biology in the first place as I was a young lad. And when I looked up, we flew over this beautiful mountain called Cerro Pelon. And here's monarchs have been overwintering in this forest every year going back to the beginning. And it's just such an incredibly beautiful place. And the, the field that you're looking at down below is a, a lava bed. Hmm. Having a little trouble with this. And about Earlier this year, we had a seminar in, in Austin, Texas. And the, the original discoverer was Kath, Catalina Brueger and her husband, Ken Brueger. And nobody, the, the National Geographic kept it very quiet as to where the discovery was originally made. And we got together and we had this reunion in Texas. And Kathy Brueger was there, who I've become really good friends with since. Yeah. And I had my green pointer, which you can see up there on the right. Yeah. And in the middle of my little talk, I, Kathy was sitting right in front of me. And I said, Catalina, point to the butterflies where you found them. And there it is. That's her holding the pointer. And a friend of mine <laughs> took that picture and captured that moment. It was a very exciting moment because we didn't know from 1975 to, to 2014 where the butterflies were originally discovered. So we. We formed a whole bunch of, of expeditions from the University of Florida where I moved to so I'd be closer to the butterflies. This is field camp with Mexicans and colleagues. Here the monarchs are coming in. You can see the volcanic mountains in the background. It's in the transvolcanic region of central Mexico. And here they're coming in there. You can see the volcanic mountains. This would be the timing of the arrival of the butterflies is so tight. It's almost always within one day of the 1st of November. Hmm. It's just amazing. And they come in and they cluster on cedars, pines, and OEMLs. And then, it, then they drop down into these OEML forests, a little bit lower elevation, where they're safe and sound in the, in the upper parts of the protected valleys. They also cluster on the tree trunks. 
And uh, the butterflies on those tree trunks are so close that it's just really competitive. And we're gonna see that's a very important behavior to protect them when it gets really cold. The monarch area in Mexico, this map shows it, it's about 60 miles from the diagonally from the top left to the bottom right and about 30 miles back and forth to the left. So it's this tiny area within which there are 12 mountain ranges. And although there are other areas in Mexico that which have similar forests, nobody, we have been unable to find monarchs in those forests. Well, the question was, there must be more, there must be more than 12 mountain ranges that have these monarchs. So we got together with a group called Lighthawk and a friend of mine who became a, a really wonderful colleague, Dan Slayback, and I flew with Lighthawk over the areas, taking aerial pictures and learning how to spot them from the air and looking for more colonies. Here you see the Rosario colony, this, all those brown covered trees. They're not dead trees, they're monarch butterflies absolutely covering those trees. Just incredible. And that was about three and a half hectares, which is about seven, I think it was the equivalent of eight football fields of butterflies. Here's another one looking down at the Sierra Chinqua colony again, and you can see the brown color in the center part of that slide. And that's in the so-called Arroyo Honda, of the Arroyo of the uh, Sierra Chinqua, a beautiful colony. And if you look at this picture, you'll notice that the butterflies are avoiding the treetops. And again, the brown color are all monarchs. And you'll see why they're, later on, I'll tell you why they're avoiding the, the treetops. So question we asked her, why are, why are monarchs coming? Oh, so with all that aerial reconnaissance that we did, we did not find a single colony other than the ones that we knew were there to begin with. And so for some very strange reason, the butterflies are limited to this region, which makes the conservation of this region that much more important. And that was just evident right from the beginning. Next one. So why do, why do they come to these forests? Well, this is a satellite image <clears throat> taken about 10 years ago on a clear day. And you can see little red spots are where the colonies are. Can you see those okay? Yeah. Yeah. And so that shows almost all the overwintering sites, not completely, but almost all of them. Why do they come? Look at this next picture. If we go back, clear. Wind coming off the Pacific Ocean as it blows over the tops of those mountains condenses the clouds and bathes the butterflies in moisture. And here you can see the clouds coming in and here they're going up and the butterfly colony is just to the left. And if it weren't for this moisture bank coming in and bathing, there wouldn't be an OML forest, there wouldn't be monarchs. Everything is dependent upon that climatic miracle that's going on in that part of the world. And here you can see the drops of rain on the, on the trees and the clusters of butterflies. Well, so the problems of survival in the winter, there are challenges, all sorts of challenges, and I'll talk about three of them. I'll talk about desiccation, I'll talk about predation and freezing. We don't have time to go into the issue of starvation. <laughs> but anyway, let's, this shows the dry and wet season. If you look at the green bars on the bottom, that's the, that's the height of the dry season when the butterflies are there. And then during the summer wet season, they, they're gone, but they come back. And so the butterflies are there at right from the beginning of the dry season and it gets drier and drier and drier as the season goes on. And by March, it's just bone dry. And here you can see how bone dry it is on, that, on the Llanos, the big open plain. That's on the Sierra Pelon area. So what do the butterflies do when it gets so dry? If there's not a rainy period, which there may not be for several weeks, the butterflies will fly out and they'll look for springs and seeps and uh, edges of streams. And here you see millions of them flying. And if you were to turn to the right and look at that, you'd see a stream of butterflies flying back to the colony as the ones in front of us are flying out to the colony. It's just, and here they are drinking. So drinking water, having pure water, having clean water nearby these forests is an important part of the biology of, of the monarch. Now, 
One of my main reasons for wanting to go to Mexico was to test out the chemical ecology idea. Are these butterflies chemically protected? Are the birds avoiding them? And here you see a, a butterfly with no head. And it was turned out the birds are eating many butterflies. So how did that contradict what we thought was the, the chemical protection of the butterflies? And we discovered that there were two main species of birds, a black-backed oriole, which is on the top of that picture, the yellow feathers, and then the black-headed grosbeak. So we asked ourselves, how many, how many butterflies are actually being killed by these birds? So we set up nets, we put 100 nets in the colony, and as the birds were eating them, the wings would drop down in the nets so we could count up the number of butterflies and calculate the number of butterflies that they're eating. And basically, what we found was that they're eating an average of about 5,000 butterflies per day, and sometimes they're eating up to 12,000, and over the course of the winter, they were probably eating in that one colony as many as a million butterflies. But you'll also notice that there's a cycle in the number of the butterflies that are eaten. And if, if you're given injection of digitoxin, it'll take exactly seven days to get out of your system. And the cycle in the bird cycle is 6.8 days. So we think that what's going on is the birds are coming in and they're eating until they get sick and then they're leaving. And they, so anyway. <laughs> So the next issue with the butterflies, so, so, so what is going on is, let me go back one, I think I skipped a slide. So what is, what is going on here is that the, it turns out, and Linda, my wife, who you're going to meet later today, um, Linda and I, she for her, her undergraduate thesis at Amherst College, discovered that the orioles are taste rejecting the butterflies that are toxic. So they're taking the high emetic unit butterflies and dropping them and not, not killing them. Whereas the gross beak, it turns out, is relatively insensitive to the poison so that they can both tolerate it up to a certain, <coughs> up to a certain point. So, so they are eating the butterflies. The chemical protection is working, but it's not perfect. And the message there is that no defense is ever perfect. It's always broken through. Yeah, if you're a million of them, it's slightly <laughs> imperfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now let's talk about uh, the problem of freezing. The, here's a monarch that got stuck out in the open from out from underneath the forest, and you can see that it's frosted. And when they freeze, they die. A little, here we are in the tropics in the middle of winter in January 1981. We had no idea what we were in for camping up there. And the storm lasted for 12 days with snow, rain, hail, sleet, and the butterflies were knocked down by the millions. These guys are actually lucky because it snowed on top of them and they didn't freeze to death because it protected them. And um, then again in 2002, the worst storm that on record that we have a record for killed probably a billion butter, half a billion butterflies wow. in the overwintering region. And this was one of my students, you can see her completely buried. There were butterflies that were dead on the ground up to two feet deep in areas. It was just unbelievable. And we calculated by counting butterfly samples through the colony that about 80% um, of the colony was killed and that 5,000 butterflies per, per meter squared were, were on the ground dead. It was just unbelievable. That hit the news. And so one of my students, Jim Anderson, is shown on the left, and one of Linda's students on the right, have studied the, what sort of, do, do monarchs have any freezing resistance? And the answer is, if you look at that left slide, you'll see a bunch of spikes. If you put a probe, a temperature probe, in the butterfly, put the butterfly in a vial, put the butter vial in a cold bath, and drop the temperature, you can determine the temperature at which individual butterflies freeze. Because when water in the body freezes, it releases heat. And so each one of those spikes is a heat release when that individual butterfly froze to death. And if you look at the so that they, they, they were freezing at different temperatures going down to about minus 12 degrees centigrade, 12 degrees below freezing. And if you look at the graph on the right, the butterflies on the solid line, this is 
taking the temperature down, 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 how many butterflies freeze, and at about minus four, 50% of the dry butterflies freeze. At minus 12, all of them freeze. But if they're wet, they lose their freezing resistance and they, they are killed at a much lower degrees below freezing. So if they're wet and it, there's a f clearing period when it freezes, that's when the big mortality occurs and that's what happened in that 2002 storm. So we found that dry butterflies can take it down to about minus 12, but they begin dying off below at minus six. And wet butterflies were, are just almost all eliminated if it gets down to minus four, about four degrees. So we got really interested in studying the microclimate. How do the trees protect the butterflies? And that's what I'll talk about now. And the little gizmos down on the left are an example of modern technology. Those things measure the temperature every hour for two months. So we put them out on the trees and measured the temperature in the forest and on the trees and in the butterfly colonies. And I'll go through these. So if you look at this graph, you see the, 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 lighter, the lighter line, which is going up and down higher than the middle one. That is just in the open outside of the forest where there's no, no forest protecting the temperature gauge. Whereas the one in, is inside the forest and you can see that it almost hardly even ever goes below freezing inside the forest. So the trees are acting to keep it cooler during the daytime and warmer at night. And so the, it's a blanket. The forest intact is a blanket. So, so, what about, so what about are the clusters themselves protecting the butterflies? Are they warmer inside? We put these little gizmos, these little thermocrons on a dowel and we drop the dowel. In here you can see the dowel. Can you see the yeah. string in the dowel? There's a thermocron on the base of that dowel and there are two more inside the cluster. And we measured the temperature and sure enough, it's slightly warmer at night inside the cluster and cooler during the day inside the cluster. So it enhances that effect of the forest blanket. So then, then we, if you look at this graph, there were two really periods when it got really cold that we were able to document. The question we asked was, well, if you think about it, the trunk of the tree holds heat like a, like a hot water bottle. Right. And are these butterflies taking advantage of the heat radiating out of the tree trunk when it gets really, really cold? And the answer is in that graph that it was a couple of degrees warmer on the tree trunk than it, it, than it is in the open area. And the mortality was much, much lower during the severe freezes on the tree trunks. So the tree trunks are, so big trees, it's necessary to preserve these forests to keep the big trees intact. So everything we've done just indicates how important these trees are in keeping this forest intact is, is to the survival of the butterflies. Well, if you look closely at this picture again, I showed this one before, you can see the butterflies are avoiding the treetops. Well, why do they do that? So we measured the temperature at different heights by putting inside of a PVC tube, you see the thermocron in that tube to the left, and we hiked them up into the tree all the way up to 30 meters up into the top of the trees and measured it every five intervals. And basically what we found was that the temperature on the ground is cold. As you go up, 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 it gets warmer. And then as you go above the butterflies, it gets cold again. And so guess where the butterflies are? Right in the central part of the zone that is the most thermally protected. They're smart, those butterflies. They are. <laughs> <laughs> they're thermally very sensitive, is what you're showing us here. So they're thermally very sensitive, and, and all these aspects of the microclimate that's provided by the OEMLs is so important for the butterflies. So the microclimate is sensitive to human disturbances. So let's take a look at the conservation issues in Mexico. Logging, logging. This was taken in 1980. When did I take that picture? About 1980 was a major logging operation and small logging operations, little ones, big ones going on. So the Mexican government responded to the call from the conservationist community and they protected a small area. 
as a biosphere reserve, but immediately after that, these pictures were taken, the logging continued. You can see butterflies flying around, the cutting of trees. Huge logging operations began nearby. So we decided we had to get to the Mexican government, and the Mexican government said, you've got to tell us how much is happening, measure it. So we got together a group of Mexican and American scientists, and we did a GIS study and measured just how much deforestation was occurring. And basically, 44% of the forest in the region has been lost between 1971 and 1999. The government responded very positively to that in increasing the protection of the area. And so it went from what it had been as several separate units to tie the units together and vastly increase the area that's protected. So there's now a biosphere reserve, which in night, about five years ago was now as a World Heritage Site. So everybody recognizes how important this is. But even after this new decree, deforestation occurred, and here we're inside the, the protected core zone of the butterflies, supposedly like a national forest, a national park, yeah. supposed to be completely protected. You can see the cutting that's occurred, more illegal cutting in 2000. Oh, I mean, it looks like, <laughs> what are those little houses there? They're just <laughs> outside the, outside the, but, but look at the illegal cutting in the background. Yeah. And this was all done right at the, right, after the second decree was, I couldn't believe this was going on. It was such serious, serious cutting, and we, we were able to document this. And now the Mexican government, so you can see this whole area of the forest, there used to be butterflies up on the two little mountains at the top, and you can see there's one group of, of, of family people who have taken care of their forest and protected it on the left just to give you an idea of the contrast of the way it was and the way it is to the right. Horse logging. This is sustained logging, which in fact has cleared off the whole west face of Cerro Pelon. And this is where Kathy and Ken Brueger discovered the butterflies in the first place, as we've already discussed. So let's turn to conservation. So the Mexican government has, in the last five years, has made a major effort to stop the illegal logging. It's not completely stopped, but it's a, a thousand percent better than it was. Mm -hmm. So uh, congratulations to them for doing that. Uh, really, everybody appreciates this. Well, what about the United States? Milkweeds and nectar plants are obviously important for pollinating insects as well as the monarch butterfly. And here we see monarch feeding on what they do in the fall, and I don't have time to talk about this, but they actually increase their fat content by 500% on their way to Mexico. And that's all dependent upon nectar from pollination, from uh, nectar sources, wild nectar sources. Golden rods, all kinds of wildflowers and composites in the fall are really important for the butterflies. Well, about 10 years ago, Two Canadian scientists, Wassner and Hobson, did an isotope study where they showed that about 90% of the butterflies are, that migrate to Mexico are born in the area that you can see on that map. And then I can't quite read the percentage sign in the center. Can you read it? It looks like, is it 50 or 80? It's, I think it's 50. 50? It, so 50 percent of the butterflies are in that dark area, and that dark area coincides with the corn and soybean belt yeah. in the United States, as you can see in That's this where slide. That's I grew up. <laughs> yes, I know the area well. So what we've, we have measured the area, the way in which we determine the number of butterflies in Mexico is indirect. We go, World Wildlife Fund people, we train them how to do it, and the Biosphere Reserve people go out every fall, and they measure the area of each colony on all the 12 mountain ranges. And then they add those up to give a total of the number of hectares. There's two and a half acres in a hectare. They add it up to the total number of hectares occupied by the butterflies. And what we see over this 20 year period is that decline and the last three years have been the lowest number of butterflies recorded in the last, and before this time there were even more butterflies. We just don't have the data. 
so that this has been scared everybody out of their wits. The monarch is declining. Could we possibly lose this marvelous phenomenon? And what, what is causing this decline? Well, we think one of the real culprits is the soybean and corn agriculture and the introduction of Roundup, which is used in the soybean and corn fields to kill off competing plants. Well, Roundup is very effective. You can see a corn field. I took this picture last summer near Kanza Prairie in Kansas. Corn field on the left, a monoculture grass field in the middle, and monoculture soybean on the right. All of these things have been herbicided. And here you can see these corn fields running from horizon to horizon. And this shows the growth in ethanol production in the United States from corn. And this, so this is impacting the environment. And it is that environment where milkweeds are growing, which are the predominant, which are the main food of the monarch butterfly. And so if you look closely at, the, at these, look at the base of this picture. There's not a weed anywhere. These Roundup fields are just sterile fields of pure, pure monoculture corn. And the same thing is true in the soybean fields. There's not a weed in sight. That's so efficient at eliminating all native plants, nectar sources, milkweeds. Now, there's one weed. Can you see the weed growing in the yeah, middle? Right in the middle? Do you know what it is? No. Guess. Milkweed? <laughs> it's a corn plant that was genetically engineered uh, that survived. To be resistant the... <laughs> to Roundup. <laughs> right. And here's another one. <laughs> We took that last summer in Kansas. Well, in 1994, I did a, a survey in Minnesota, and here you can see the common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca, growing along the side of the cornfield and, and in the cornfields. And sorry, I went by that one. And at that time was just the beginning of the heavy use of Roundup in these fields and herbicides. And here you can see a milkweed plant that is dying having been treated with that. And basically, I predicted at, at that time, after that trip, that monoculture cultivation of corn and soybeans with Roundup and genetically engineered crops, which were resistant to Roundup, were going to result in the elimination of milkweeds and the loss of the monarch, potentially the loss of the monarchs. Well. This shows the amount of Roundup that has been used over the last 10 or 15 years. And there's not many curves that are steeper than that no. in, in science anywhere. It's just incredible. Acres of corn and soybeans treated, going from about maybe 20% to nearly 100%. And the, uh, uh, the acres of corn, I mean, what is the top saying? 155 million. 155 million acres. 155 million acres of corn. Basically, 155 million acres of milkweed habitat has been lost, and so I think that this is a major problem. And we did an experiment at Sweetbriar College where we herbicided a field, and you can see it in the front, in the foreground, and the one up on the left foreground. And that was treated with Roundup on the 8th of June, 2014. On the 30th of June, two weeks later, three weeks later, look at the field, it's sterile. Yep. It's, everything is dead, killed, 100%, ki nearly 100% kill. I think these chemicals are devastating the natural environment. We need to do something about it. The conclusion is that the monarch truly is an endangered biological phenomenon. We've had the big problem of forestry in Mexico, which is now more or less under control. But now we have this looming problem of chemical agriculture. And I think that really threatens the, the migration and the overwintering of this marvelous phenomenon. And here you see, so one of the things we did last year was present a petition to the Environmental Protection Agency, to the, to, to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And the, one of the really good things is whether or not that petition is accepted, it has raised the awareness that yes, great things are <laughs> happening for monarchs as we talk here right now. And so thank you very much for making this opportunity possible.
Well, thank you, Lincoln. We have just a couple minutes. Let me let me just ask you a question or two. Okay. Based on that fascinating talk, the obvious one is, um, besides sign the petition, which I think is over. Yes, now, it is over. Uh, what can folks do to try to bring back the monarch? Well, there's there are major efforts with the pollinating community, the po the pollination community, um, to and with Monarch Watch and with Journey North and various groups. Uh, Karen Oberhauser at the University of Kansas is running a big monarch program. Get people to plant milkweed, but make sure that they plant the right species of milkweeds. Yes. This is important because there are some there are some plants that are best not planted. But what you want to do is collect seeds locally, get them growing, and and re replant them, restore them with native plants that have grown nearby. And every as you saw in that slide, the 108 species of milkweeds in North America. Right. So the ones that you want to plant in California are going to be very different from the ones you want to plant in Illinois, and the ones in Virginia are different from Florida and so forth. So it has to be done intelligently, and we need to make sure that the plant breeders are, are not growing exotic milkweeds, because otherwise it's going to scramble this, what is potentially a very interesting, what is a very interesting evolutionary history of the milkweeds, and I'm kind of worried about yeah, that. Yeah, we don't want to mess up one species for another species. So exactly. plant milkweed, but plant the appropriate right. native milkweed to that part of the country. Right, and and you can find out the Monarch Joint Venture is another website that will tell you exactly how to plant, which, pl which plants, where to obtain them, and which ones are appropriate to plant in your area. You spent 50 years working with the Monarch. Uh, Obviously, you care about this species. Why should other people care about this butterfly? Well, you know, I had a, I, I gave a lecture to my classmates at Princeton University a few years ago, and one of the old grads in the audience got up and said, well, what difference would it make if we lost the monarch butterfly? And I thought to myself, did you really go to Princeton and ask that question? <laughs> that was one of my first thoughts. My other thought was, is, well, what, what good is the Mona Lisa? We think it's good, it's part of our culture. And I think that what the monarch is telling us is that biology is a part of our culture and we need to protect these wonderful biological phenomenon. I mean, it's a wonderful educational instrument and anybody who's tagged a butterfly and had one recaptured in Mexico is a transformed human being. So that's part of our culture. And I just think the biology needs to be more strongly made part of our culture. And anything we can do to do that and enhance that is, I think, very valuable. Well, finally, the last question is, um, I have to ask you as a historian of science, uh, this whole idea of biological phenomena yes. and protecting that, that's pretty revolutionary. And you have been one of the uh, founders of this, this idea. Tell us a little more about why we want to protect biological phenomena and how this came about. Well, I mean, I guess in a sense that our own evolution is a phenomenon, and we certainly want to protect that. To think of the elephants in Africa, the phenomena of the relationship between the mothers and the, the different aged group of elephants and how they take care of their young. There was a wonderful article on, are elephants really emotional? Should we even think about that? And in my opinion, they're highly emotional animals. And so I, I just think they're these beautiful things. I remember when I was a very young child, my mother took me into a forest and pointed out the wildflowers. And, and you walk into the forest before the trees leaf out and there are all these wildflowers. It's a spring phenomenon. And they're just all these wonderful phenomenon that we should build into our culture and appreciate them. So I, I think for our own edification and well-being and just decency that we need to protect these phenomena in, in the wild. Very eloquent, very uh, passionate, and probably a good way to go out. Okay. Lincoln, thank you so much. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. We've been speaking with Lincoln Brower, uh, who has been working probably longer than anybody else around on monarch butterflies and uh, gave us a great introduction, not only uh, as to the challenges the butterfly faces, but some possibilities about how we might protect it and also why we should. So thank you, Lincoln. Uh, thank you. And thank all of uh, you for tuning in to another Conservationist in Action. Thank you, Mark.